All right. So what I'd like to do today is continue talking about the second half of bound services. And uh, this is particularly relevant for the grad student version of the assignment and uh, hopefully for the assignment 5B part that will also be relevant as well because we'll hopefully be using bound services there too. So you recall last time we talked about the design of the the design and class structure and sort of the phases of the steps involved in initializing and binding and connecting and processing and so on, the unique ID generator application. And what we're going to do now is we're going to dive into the source code. So we're actually going to look at source. So first, just a quick recap at a high level, just so you remember the different steps that are going on here. This is kind of a, a breakdown step by step of what's happening. So when we look at the code, the pieces fit together better. So this is basically the protocol for launching, connecting, and communicating with a bound service. And despite the fact that this is the, the unique ID generator service, the same basic steps apply for almost every bound service. So the download service that we do is almost identical. So it starts on the client side when the application gets in focus, it's on start method gets called, that causes bind service to be called with an intent. The intent, of course, is associated with the service. Uh, there was a good discussion on the discussion forums, which you should read, but I'll recap it briefly just to get the point across. It turns out that using implicit intents to start services is possibly not a good idea. Does anybody know why, besides Kevin, does anybody know why implicit intents are potentially problematic? Yeah, because... Right, so the two reasons why starting a service implicitly could go awry, uh, number one, someone might accidentally have the same name that your service does or the same, the same intent filters that your service did, except that they may not understand the protocol that your service implements, so you would have things be wrong. That would be one bad thing. A more nefarious thing would be if someone intentionally started a service that was trying to do the same thing that your service was, except they were doing something bad. They were doing, you know, they were stealing all your content and shipping it off to Albonia for reverse engineering or something like that. So there are a number of reasons why you don't necessarily want to start services implicitly. So you do them explicitly instead. All right, so the, however you start the service up, the intent is launched. Uh, the, the intent launches the service. The started service um, will will be launched if it's not already running. That causes the onBind hook method to get called back in the service, which goes ahead and gets a reference to a binder object, which in this case is the messenger that's going to be the target of requests. So it's a request handler. That then sends that back to the client uh, via the onServiceConnected hook method, which is dispatched as part of a framework, the service connection framework. The uh, onServiceConnected method takes the binder stuffs it back into a messenger reference, which is stored locally on the client. And then when someone clicks generate unique ID, that causes a send method to be generated, which goes ahead and sends the request. Uh, it, it sends a method, uh, it sends a message to the request messenger, and it contains the reply messenger as part of its uh, state. That then calls the handle message method on the messenger, that's the re request messenger. That does its thing, that generates the unique ID, which as we'll see, runs in a thread in a thread pool. It then goes ahead and returns that ID back to the reply handler, which then displays the result. So that's basically the steps involved. So now we're going to look through the code that does all this stuff. Here very quickly is the protocol for shutting things down. The client calls unbind service, or on stop is called, that causes unbind service to be called, which causes on unbind to be called, which returns false by default. And then it goes ahead and the, if that's the last, if this is the last activity that had a binding to the bound service, then Android goes ahead and shuts the service down. And one of the steps that is involved in shutting a service down is to call its on destroy lifecycle hook method. And that goes ahead and cleans up any resources like the executor that's running. So those are basically all the steps. And you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here. But this is a very common set of things. All right. So here then is the, uh, the implementation of all this stuff. We'll just quickly look at the classes. So there's the generator service, which is the guy that is kind of providing the service. And it has a request messenger, which a reference of which is sent back to the client, to the activity. 
It's also got a request handler, which is the class that processes things in a thread pool. The activity is basically interacting with the user. It's got a reply messenger. That's what it offers up, and it passes that back to the, or it passes that over to the service when a request is sent to get an ID. And uh, it also has a reference to the request messenger, so it can make method calls via this proxy, this reference. And it's got a reply handler that knows how to take results and display them. So those are basically the steps that it has. What's interesting is just the, the symmetry that's involved between the service and the activity through all these different steps. All right, so here's the code. This is the unique ID generator activity, which is always inherits from activity. It's got a couple of fields that it uses to do things like write the, the output, it displays the, the uh, unique ID. In a real program, you'd probably do something with it, but here it just displays it. It's also got a reference to a request messenger, which is actually pointing to the one that's over in the server, on the service side. And um, it also has a reply messenger, which is what it's going to pass to the service. And that reply messenger actually keeps track of a, of a handler that it uses internally. So the uh, service connection mechanisms that the client has, as you can see here, when, uh, when the program starts, and this is an important thing, especially for the grad students doing assignment number four, when the program starts up, it needs to create this service connection in the main thread of control. These, these callback methods have to be dispatched in the UI thread. So this, by defining this in a way where it gets created in the UI thread, then it makes sure it's got affinity with that thread. When the service is bound, the on-service connected hook method gets called back. And as you can see here, it takes the binder and wraps a messenger around it and stashes it away in this, this local variable. If the service crashes, this hook method gets called back to say, you have to rebind. It's, it's not, uh, not set up anymore. Here's the onStart method. OnStart gets called when the application is ready to begin to run shortly before onPaused gets called back. This will go ahead and call bind service. And it's going to bind to what's ever returned from a call to make intent. Just another quick reminder, hopefully everybody fixed this in their assignment four code, but make sure that you're using the factory methods like make intent and so on, or make gallery intent in order to make the intents rather than having to hard code that logic into your activity. Just makes it one more thing to have to change when the implementation evolves. The service connection is the thing we saw over here that actually goes ahead and, and does the handshake. So that's essentially what goes on from the client's point of view with respect to binding to things. Here's the method that gets called back when the user presses the generate unique ID button. As you can see in this particular case, it's going to uh, obtain a message, which it's going to use to, to talk, or it's going to send this message over to the, to the service. It stuffs the reply messenger in the reply to field of the message. This is a little bit subtle. So typically when we use messages, we're mostly accustomed to using messages with, within the same address space, within the same process. For example, the Android Hammer framework does that. It creates messages and it passes them around between threads. In this case, we're actually going to be sending things that go across address spaces. And so in this case, we're going to be putting a messenger in the reply to field. And that will be properly handled by the Android system to marshal it and pass it over as one of the fields that goes along with the message so that the receiver can crack it open and, and get the, the reply messenger from it. After that, we then go ahead and make a send call, which sends the request to the request messenger. Yes, Kevin. Yeah, great, great, great question. So the question is, why are things like reply to or arg1, arg2, obj, why are those public? Anybody want to take a guess about that? What's the reason for that? Yes? So they're definitely accessed in a public way, yes. But, well, let me rephrase the question. What would be an alternative way of structuring the classes. When? Mutators. Use what? Mutators. Right, so you'd have methods, mutators and accessor methods, sort of like a get, you know, you'd have a method called get reply to and set reply to. That's the more sort of purest, object-oriented style of doing things. Oftentimes when people get to a certain point in a project, they're like, 
oh my gosh, what a, what a pain in the butt defining all these accessors. Let's just make the fields public, um, which has a downside, right? The downside is if you make any changes, a lot of things break. So one of the things that this implies is they will never change those, those fields. They will be there forever. Um, whereas if you use a little bit of abstraction, sometimes you can shield yourself from changes. On the other hand, set reply to, get reply to, you know, unless you do something really special in there to hide the differences, those things get etched in stone as well. So there's a whole school of thought that says accessor methods are bad also, accessors are mutator methods. But that's basically why. They, they just kind of got lazy <laughs> and decided it wasn't worth doing it. But that's a good question. So the request gets sent. That, of course, causes it to go across the address space boundaries. You don't know. You don't care how it works. It just gets delivered over there. Here's the reply handler. This is now what gets called back when the service is finished generating the unique ID, and it wants to get the ID back to the activity to go ahead and, and uh, display it. So it extends handler, which means it's got a handle message method. And uh, again, this, this, this class or instances of this class will have affinity to the threads in which they're created. So in our particular case, we just create it in the main thread. So this processing gets called back in the main thread of control, which is very convenient, as you'll see here in a second. But that's not necessarily the case. You could also have it run in the background thread uh, on the activity side, but then you'd have to divert it back to the main thread in order to get the the display to show up properly to the user, because you can only have one thing at a time uh, that's running. You can only have the main thread or the UI thread doing UI operations. Here's handle message. This gets called back when we get a response from the service. This does a, a clever little trick. I like to do this. I, I like to try to localize the representation of the information we're passing back and forth. So we don't want to require the activity side to know all the nitty gritty details about how these messages are formed. We want to kind of hide that information as much as possible. So we define a little, a little method. This is really a little uh, accessor method called unique ID that's defined on the generator service. And if you give it a reply message, it will give you back the ID that's unique from that message. Now, why do we do that? Why, what's the reason why, why we do this? Or another question is, what would be an alternative way of doing this? So we do send a message back. The, the alternative would be require the activity to know the format of the message to reach into it and pull out the various fields, like the unique ID that was nestled in there. But man, that gets really, that's kind of the same question you were just asking. You start exposing those fields. You start binding yourself to a particular implementation. If you come up with a better way of doing things or Android changes or there's a bug, a lot of code has to change. So this is just another good example of using a tiny bit of abstraction to shield those kinds of details from the client. Since the service is the one that made this message, it's only fitting the service be the one to, un to unpack it. Yes, sir? Well, we had just been talking about the fact that with a service, you really ought to be starting services with so-called explicit intents, where you, you kind of connect them very tightly. Um, implicit intents have two problems. One, your protocols may not work. And number two, you may have a Trojan horse sneak in a malicious implementation that will bite you when you least expect it. When? Uh, why for assignment four do you have to use implicit? Because I learned that two days ago. Life is, a, life is a unique process of continually getting smarter and smarter until your brain explodes. And so my brain got one step closer to exploding. So here's, the, uh, here's what happens. You get back the unique ID, and then we just go ahead and set that as the field that's the display. All right, so that's the uh, bulk of the activity side. There's still just a little bit more. When this activity goes away, now this, is, this is important, right, to think this through. When the activity goes away, then we also want to provide the opportunity for the service to go away. Remember how reference, how uh, lifecycle management of bound services works? Lifecycle management of bound services works such that as long as somebody is bound to the service, it will not shut down. So when the activity goes away, rather than leaving that service running, when it might no longer have any activities that are relating to it, what we're going to do is we're going to call unbind service 
in the on stop method, which will cause the service to go away if this was the last client that was bound to it. If there are other clients, it'll stay up. But if it's the last one, it goes away. Questions about that? And then we call up to the, the super class and say, hey, you know, we're done. You can shut yourself down as well. So that's, that's a very common idiom for controlling the life cycle of services. It's really a, a dance that requires both the client and the service to participate in that little, little dance. OK, so um, let's look at the service implementation. Now, the service implementation is actually quite a bit more interesting. And it'll give us a chance also to talk about another important feature of concurrency, which we've only touched upon briefly, but you really need to understand. And that is the concept of a thread pool. So when you create a runnable and you call start on the runnable, what happens in a, in a general sense? Or when you create a new thread and call start on it? Yeah, Josh. Start, start. So a new, a new thread starts, right? And uh, we haven't really gone into the great detail of this, but if you were to go watch a few of the videos that we didn't have a chance to cover, you would see that there's a lot of steps involved in creating a thread that requires you know, dozens of calls to low-level uh, parts of Android and Linux and libraries in between doing all kinds of crazy things. So starting a thread for everything you do is potentially a fair amount of overhead. Now, just thinking, just thinking aloud and looking for insight from the class, what, under what circumstances might it make sense to create a thread for some work to do? What would be a, a good example of a circumstance where that would be a win? Or asked a different way, when would it be not such a good idea to create a thread? When? All right, so you're probably talking about dependencies, right? So that's, that's one thing, but there's another, there's another more easy reason. Kevin? When something has to go in a certain specific order, and you can't, you can't have two things happening concurrently. So, so ordering, dependencies, those are, those are good things. But I'm, I'm actually heading in a slightly different direction. Vikas? Uh, certainly resources are, you know, every time you spawn a thread, a, a big chunk of virtual memory is allocated typically, usually a megabyte of virtual memory. So if you were to have, uh, if you were to write a server that had 60,000 clients connected to it simultaneously, spawning a thread for every client would be prohibitively expensive with respect to resource utilization. So that, that's a good example. So it hogs up too much resources. You probably don't have 60,000 cores, right? So having 60,000 threads is not going to help you run things any faster. But I'm trying to think, what, what are, what's another reason why you wouldn't want to spawn a thread? So we talked about dependencies. We talked about using too much memory. What's another thing? I, I just gave you a hint. I said it takes a while to make a thread. When, when you're going to do something that takes almost no time to run, you're going to add two numbers together, and they're like ints, right? So it's like 1 plus 2. No point in spawning a thread to add two numbers. The, by the amount of time it takes to spawn the thread, you could have just computed the result and you're done, right? So threads are mostly useful when the thing you're going to do that needs to run in the background is very long running relative to the time required to create a new thread. I'll give you an example from everyday life. Let's say that um, you know, you're, let's say you're managing a small team for a project course at Vanderbilt or you have a summer job where you're working with a bunch of other people. And work is coming in to be done, and, and it's your job to sort of triage the work. If the work to be done is very quick, like you, know, you just have to respond, say yes or no, probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to hand that work off to somebody else, because it's going to take longer to, to forward the message to them and explain to them what you want them to do than to do it yourself. So for really short running things, you're, you're better off just doing it than trying to hand it off to somebody else. On the other hand, if you've got to do something that's going to take weeks to do, and you've got other things on your plate, you may not want to take on that responsibility. So in that case, it probably makes more sense to break it off and hand it off to somebody else. And the little startup time required to get them up to speed is more than compensated for the amount of work that happens by things running together. OK, so that, that was a roundabout way of saying that creating threads is not always the right thing to do. So what is a better thing to do? Well, what we're about to talk about is using a pool of threads. And that's a way of 
amortizing the creation costs of a thread. And as long as there's a free thread available in the pool, when work comes in, you can quickly hand it off to the, the thread in the thread pool. A uh, good example of this would be like a call center where you've got operators standing by. And so as calls come in, as long as there's a free operator, then the calls get handled. Once the operators are all busy, then you wait in a queue and they play Muzak or something like that. Okay, so the generator service extends service. It's going to use a pool of threads. You can see our little Apple cores down here to indicate cores. So in general, a thread pool is a win um, and can improve performance on a multi-core device as long as certain things apply. And we'll kind of talk about that as we go through this. So let's talk a bit about how our service is going to be defined. We're going to have a request handler, just like the activity has a reply handler. The service has a request handler. Its job is to handle messages that are sent from the activity. It's also going to have a request messenger, which is going to encapsulate the request handler. And it's got an on-bind hook method, which is really a factory method that returns the binder for the request messenger. And that's just there to hold the whole handshaking protocol in place to get things started up. All right. So here's the onCreate method. This is what gets called back when the service is created for the first time. As you can see here, we just do something. We go ahead and make a new request handler. And we go ahead and uh, stick that into the messenger so that that will also be available. Uh, and you could actually put that up in the, in the uh, where the field is defined. But I just put it here just to do something here. Here are the factory methods. We have make intent and unique ID. Make intent just goes ahead and makes an intent that connects this with the class, but it doesn't expose that to the client. And then unique ID takes the reply message and fishes out the appropriate information. That's the string. That's the ID that we've got. All right. So let's talk about the interesting part. Right? This is the part that's fun. So we're going to show the implementation of the request handler. The request handler is the guy that services requests. Its reference is sent back to the client. The client gets a proxy to the request messenger, and it calls send to send it messages. The request messenger has some important things in it. One of the things it's got is a count of the number of threads we want to have in the thread pool. Now it turns out that in, in now we're going to actually kind of dive a little bit deeper into some Java-isms to do this implementation. We're, we're about to talk about stuff that comes out of the Java util concurrent package. So this is not strictly part of the Android concurrency framework, although you can certainly use the Java executor framework and, and Java util concurrent code in your Android programs. And here's a good example of how to use it. So there are two different ways to have thread pools. Or actually, there's many different ways to have thread pools in, in Java. But the two we're going to look at, or two we're going to mention right now, one of them is called a fixed size thread pool. And as the name implies, it creates a fixed number of threads. And it creates them at, at some preordained point in time. So those threads are always available for use. And there's another kind of thread pool called a cached thread pool. And a th cached thread pool is a little different. It does not create a fixed size pool of threads uh, ahead of time. It creates threads on demand up to a certain cap. And if those threads aren't used within a short time, typically like a minute, the threads are killed off. And so that way, as the pool gets bigger during bursty periods, the threads will disappear when the system's traffic patterns quiesce, when things get less, uh, less hectic. So it basically is dynamic, whereas the fixed thread pool is more static. And there are pros and cons of each one. Uh, the nice thing about the fixed thread pool is it pre-creates all the threads ahead of time so that cost is amortized at startup time. And you would typically want to create the number of threads that are roughly about the number of cores you've got, maybe times two or something like that. There's no sense, just a little aside about concurrency uh, tuning, there's no sense in having thousands of threads with only a handful of core. You're, you're typically just going to be creating extra work for your operating system to manage all these threads that are idle, and only a handful of them can run at a time. It does make sense usually to create more threads and cores, though, in case the threads block, in which case other threads that are not blocked can, can run on the cores. So max threads are the number of threads. Here's the thread pool implementation, which is this thing called an executor service. We'll talk briefly about that. And then the final thing in here, it's kind of interesting. It's something called shared preferences. 
And shared preferences is basically a persistent hash map. So if you're familiar with hash maps in Java, they're basically ways of mapping some kind of key to some kind of value. A shared preference or shared preferences is a way of being able to do hash maps that are stored persistently. So if the program shuts down and starts up again, you keep the same values in, in the memory that you have. So we're going to use them to make sure the IDs are unique. Here's the constructor for request handler. It goes ahead and uh, creates the shared preferences file, which is, you can read about it here, basically gives you a way to have a file backed hash map. And it creates a new fixed size thread pool with four threads in this particular case. So that gets done one time when the service gets launched. Here then is the handle message method. Keep in mind, this is called back whenever a client, and keep in mind there could be lots of clients, whenever a client goes ahead and asks to see what the next unique ID is. So when it does that, when it sends that request over, handle message gets called back. It extracts out the messenger from the request. That's where who we're going to reply to. And then, I think uh, Josh might have mentioned this before, now we're going to go ahead and execute something, right? So before we're not going to start it, we're going to execute it. Execute doesn't start a new thread. Instead, it hands off the runnable to a queue, and when a thread is available in that queue, th that manages that queue, when a thread is available, it doesn't have anything else to do, it'll reach up, grab the next runnable off the queue, and run it. So that way we don't have to create a thread for every one of these runnables. We'll instead put it in the queue. Jonathan? For the thread cache, what's the reason for having a maximum thread count? Um, just because you don't want to just spawn threads till the cows come home and your system falls over from too many threads. That would be a potential denial of service attack, right? You, you would cause the system to use too much memory because you just make lots of requests and there'd be a huge burst of threads. So here we're going to go ahead and make a new runnable. We'll look in more detail about what the runnable does and that runnable gets executed by the thread, by a thread in the thread pool. The runnable will generate a unique ID and then send it back to the client. So that's what the runnable does. And then we're going to look at these in more detail. Now, the key thing to remember when you start using threads and pools of threads is you have to be careful if those threads access shared state. That's when things get in trouble. So you know we have, these, uh, we have this every day in, in our everyday lives. If you're driving down the road and two cars decide they both want to merge together into the same lane at the same time, you have a, a crash, right? Things smash into each other because they can't both be in the same place at the same time. And there are equivalent sorts of challenges that are called race conditions that are the bane of concurrent programming. And we're going to talk a bit about them. And we won't talk exhaustively about how to detect them and, and solve them, but they're, they're the bane of concurrent programming if, if you use this type of concurrency model. Here's the generate unique ID method. This is what's going to create the unique system-wide ID. So as you can see here, this is just about you know, 12 lines of code or so. It starts out by using a synchronized block. Remember we talked before about synchronized blocks? Synchronized blocks are Java built-in features that ensure only one thing at a time is active, even if there are many threads trying to contend. The example is the restroom protocol in an, air, in an airplane restroom. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to generate a unique ID. And to do that, there's a, there's a UUID class. UUID stands for universally unique ID. And it will generate a random UUID every time you call it. It'll give you back a random UUID. The problem is, as improbable as it may be, the randomness factor might end up with duplicates. So it's possible that you will randomly generate the same UUID. Now, in theory at least, it would take you know, a long time for that to happen. But there's all kinds of weird bugs and quirks. So we're, and we're going to be very paranoid. So what we're going to do here is every time we generate what we think is potentially a unique ID, we then go check with our shared preferences persistent hash map to see whether that ID has already appeared or not. And what we do is we say, have you seen this thing already? And if it says, yes, I have, we know it's not unique, right? If it hasn't seen it, then we're going to go ahead and store it. But in either case, we're, this loop is going to keep going until we get ourselves back a unique random ID. And then it's going to go ahead and, and say to the, the uh, shared preferences object, I want to do an update. And this is just some weird way that they do their work. It could be done other ways. You get an editor 
And then you go ahead and update the item by its key, which in this case is the unique ID value itself. So we basically say we have now seen this thing, and then we commit this, and that goes to backing store. That writes it to the, to the persistent file that backs up this hash map. So after it goes through all those rigmaroles, th this is a discussion about the probability of duplicates in a random UUID algorithm, which is admittedly low, but we're being paranoid. And when this thing is finally done, we go ahead and uh, update it, and we commit. And then the last thing we do is we go ahead and get a message. We stick the unique ID as a field, as a string in the message. And then we go ahead and we send that back to the client. So the client now gets that string or gets a message back that contains a string that has the unique ID. And keep in mind, that was all done in a background thread. Now, can anybody tell me why we have a synchronized block around this region of code? Yes. Right. So to reiterate that, um, random. So so we have to protect this code because checking for uniqueness and updating when we think we found something unique needs to be an atomic operation. If it's not atomic, then we'll end up with duplicates in there and they won't be detected by the system. So the typical um, secret sauce of using concurrency is to try to figure out things that need to run atomically and then using the appropriate synchronization mechanisms to ensure stuff happens in the right order and with uh, the proper atomic assurances. <coughs> okay, so that's basically, in a nutshell, how you might write a bound service that uses messengers as the communication mechanism. And there's lots and lots of examples of that in Android. The more common way of doing bound service in, in Android, however, is actually using something called AIDL, which is a very interesting mechanism. We may or may not have time to talk about it in this class. If we have time at the end, I'll cover it. Um, but uh, that gives you a way to make method calls as a way to pass information back and forth. And I'll show you a simple example in just a second that's uh, in Android itself. So those are some examples of things that, that you would commonly run across. If you're ever interested in learning more about that, of course, you can go and, and watch the videos that are out to talk about it. So at this point, we've talked about started services and we've talked about bound services. Now we're going to talk briefly about so-called hybrid services. And a hybrid service is a service that contains elements of both bound and unbound services. And there are reasons why we would want to do this kind of thing. And there's a nice discussion about this in the uh, Android documentation that explains the circumstances under which you'd want these kinds of things. So the way that this works is if the bound service, if you write a bound service and you implement the on start command method, then the service won't be destroyed when all of the clients unbind from it. It'll continue to run. Because what you're basically saying is, I will take control over the life cycle of this service, which is a little bit weird. And we'll talk about why you would want to do this. Um, and then there's also some other low-level mechanisms here that talk about rebinding and you can get new, um, you, can, you can basically force it to rebind when a client connects after all the other clients have gone away. Now let's talk about an example of something that works this way. So the uh, music playback service, which is what you get on Android when you're playing songs on your Android device, is an example of a hybrid service. And uh, we have a few minutes, let's see, I'm trying to think. See if I'm brave enough to try to go and show you this code. All right, so there's the music service. And let's see if we've got a service in here anywhere before we get too further down. Ah, good. There's a service, I think. Let's see. All right, so check this out. So this is a good example of a service that uh, does this. We will say extends service. 
All right, so there you go. There is your music media. Whoops, I actually don't see that. Let me get rid of this. All right, so here's the code. Let's make it nice and big. Hopefully you can see that in the back. So here's the, the Android Media Playback Service, which is a service. And one of the things you should see here is it's going to implement the on start command method. So, so that means that it's going to be a started service. That's one of the things it's going to do. And I also think if you take a look at the on bind method, it also implements on bind. So this is kind of a weird thing. It's like a platypus, right? Is it, is it a mammal? Is it a bird? What is exactly is it? So it's basically combining the boundness of a bound service because it implements on bind, which means someone can bind to it, but it also implements on start command. So once it starts to run, it'll remain running independent of the life cycle of activities that are currently active. Now, why would a music service want to do this? What's, what's the motivation for, for wanting to be able to have the service continue to run even if there's no activity that is connected to it? Keep the music playing, right? Exactly. So, uh, if you bring up your, if you bring up your Android, uh, you know, music app, and you download a song, you click on a song to play. Then, depending on the setting you have for it, when you move away from that activity, you can even shut the activity down. The song will still continue to play in the background. It won't shut the song down. So that's why we want the service to have a lifetime that is independent of the activity that started it. So even though it's, uh, even though it started. It, we want it to continue to run. So that's why it's a started service. Now, why is it also a bound service? Well, the reason it's a bound service becomes clear when you look over here at the AIDL file. So here's the iMedia playback service. And this is the set of operations that the music player service supports. And if you look at these things, you know, you, you get a pretty good idea, right? So um, stop play, pause, prev, next, right? These are all obviously things that are used to control the service. What, it, what song it's playing? Is it playing? Have you stopped it? Have you told it to skip over a song? Blah, blah, blah. And then there's also a pot of other things that you can use to set various properties, like do you want to be in shuffle mode or repeat mode? Do you want to remove stuff? Do you want to find metadata about the various songs and so on and so forth? And these are all written as methods in the AIDL language, which looks basically like a Java interface. So you can write code that just makes method calls to do all these various operations instead of having to program all this stuff by creating messages yourself, which would be very low level and tedious and uh, not, very, not very fun to write, not very fun to debug, and probably slow as well. So this is a good example of why you want to use the bound service, because that works nicely for this kind of thing to use strongly typed communication, but you also want this service to run uh, indefinitely, so you make it a started service. All right, so that's bound service and started service. So just to wrap up, talk about some of the usage considerations. A bound service is essentially a server in a client-server interaction that can afford to run for an extended period of time. And so in that particular case, you'd want to have the service be able to do some long-running dialogue, some long-running conversation with a client that's going to be doing things like starting and stopping the playing of music or whatever. So we use this to be able to pass information back to generate IDs. Notice that that service might actually be running indefinitely because you might want unique IDs for all kinds of things in your program. And the bound service lives only while it serves other application components, right? So it's kind of like uh, Sauron, to use my endless Lord of the Rings metaphors. Uh, when the ring goes away, he goes away too, right? Or Horcruxes or whatever. Good uh, science fiction, science fantasy literature metaphors. So the ID service doesn't run in the background indefinitely. It'll only run as long as there's a client that's bound to it. And that's just the way we did it, but we could change it. Under the hood, there are, of course, a lot of mechanisms that are provided by the Android platform like the binder and other mechanisms for communicating between address spaces and 
handling messaging and uh, remote procedure calls and so on and so forth. And those implement various patterns like broker and proxy. 